In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. All praises to Allah, the creator of the universes and their sustainer, the provider of believers and unbelievers. And may his choicest blessings be on the seal of his prophets, the last of his messengers and his holy progeny. And in particular, may his incessant blessings ever continue to flow on the seventh successor to the holy prophet, on Imam Musa Kadim Salawatullahi wa salamu Yesterday we examined how documentary evidence in the way of a testament of a testament was left by the sixth Imam alayhi salam in which the appointment of the seventh Imam alayhi salam as his successor as his only true successor became apparent. But quite apart from that documentary evidence, moving by the traditional methods by which we establish the appointment of an Imam by his predecessor also applies in respect of the seventh Imam alayhi salam. There is, as I said yesterday, abundance of evidence, indeed set out even in the Sunnite sources, from which it becomes very clear that the person appointed to be the Imam alayhi salam succeeding the sixth Imam alayhi salam was Imam Musa Kadhib alayhi salam. And before I even put to you a logical argument in, in that respect, can I set out these authorities to you? I will not detain you over them, but only to give you about a dozen of them in a matter of two or three minutes, so that you are assured of the existence of these authorities. So that it is becomes clear that the sixth Imam alayhi salam did not leave his adherents without guiding them as to the succession after him. And these hadiths, as I said, are well reported. For example, Sheikh Mufid alayhi rahma reports of Mufaddal bin, bin Amr. Mufaddal, as we saw, was a close companion of the sixth Imam alayhi salam. And was he? to leave the sixth Imam alayhi salam without knowing whom to follow after him. Mufaddal, as I indicated the other day, was one of the very intelligent companions of uh, the Imam alayhi salam. Indeed, as I said, he asked the Imam numerous questions. Questions on why was anybody created? Why, for example, was a moth created? Why was a fish created? How does a fish sustain itself? On myriad multitudes of matters. So much so that that sitting 
with Muf which Mufaddal had with Imam Sadiq alayhi salam became the subject of a book by itself, a volume by itself on, on the questions asked by him. Would he not then have asked who the successor would be? Indeed. The contrary is the situation. When he did ask who would be the successor, Imam Kadhim alayhi salam was but a little boy. Sheikh Mufid alayhi salam says that he was wa huwa ghulamun, he was a little boy then. And when Mufaddal asked the sixth Imam who his successor would be, he pointed out the seventh Imam alayhi salam. And indeed, even on those delicate days, said to Mufaddal, when you come across your friends, your companions whom you trust, tell them also that this is my successor. You can imagine, you can imagine that the Imam alayhi salam made his successor known 20 years before his martyrdom, well in good time. And there is good reason for it. They knew very well what happened after the Holy Prophet, may peace be upon him and his progeny. And hence, the importance to take precaution in good time. Mu'az bin Kathir, he also saw the sixth Imam alayhi salam and asked him exactly that question. But one can see the anxiety of Mu'az because the way he asked the question to the Imam alayhi salam was that, Yabna Rasulillah, save me from the fire of hell. And the Imam alayhi salam says, Mu'ad, what is worrying you? It is my function to save you from the fire of hell. In what respect do you want me to save you from the fire of hell? The Imam of course knew exactly what Mu'ad meant. But it was for the companion sitting around him. And Mu'ad says, Yabna Rasulillah, I do not wish that after you I should follow one who is not the true successor, who is not the true Imam. Tell me now who your successor will be. And indeed, the, 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 the hadith on the point is that at that very time, the seventh Imam alayhi salam was sleeping in the adjoining room. The Imam alayhi salam takes Mu'adh and those who were present says, Come you all and see who your next Imam will be. Takes them to the next door. The Imam alayhi salam was sleeping. They said, we mustn't disturb him. The Imam alayhi salam says, he doesn't need to be disturbed. But look at him, see him, and know him. Three conditions the Imam alayhi salam put. Look at him, see him, and know him. Because he is your Imam after him. And indeed, even if at the risk of interposing, would you not have expected Imam Sadiq salam to do that? We spent a week talking about his wisdom. We spent a week talking about his enthusiasm about saving Islam. Indeed, he was the one who said, we must advance and enhance knowledge. Would he therefore not be keen himself to make sure that that community of intellectuals that community of advancing people that he was trying to create should remain properly guided after him and would he not have made sufficient provision in that regard himself. Abdurrahman bil Hijjah Hajjaj says he too had occasion once to, to be with the Imam alayhi salam and Mindar uh, Masjid he was, he was making his, his address as usual in the in the in the mosque and at the end of the address Abdurrahman says I took occasion to go to him and say Ibn Rasulullah this was beautiful I learned a lot but I do not want to leave this mosque today without knowing whom to follow after you this ocean of knowledge which you spreading right through us will continue to flow but we will need to know from where it flows and what is its correct path and the Imam alayhi salam says, O oh, Abdurrahman, I have had the armor, the armor of the Holy Prophet, may peace be upon him and his progeny, tried, and it has only fitted my son Musa, and hence, after me, Musa is my successor. Just a few seconds on this. We've discussed this, but years ago in 1996. But we have mentioned about it even in respect of the sixth Imam alayhi salam. 
that the holy prophet may peace be upon him had his own armaments his own sword which he passed to imam ali alayhi salam the zulfiqar that we're talking about and he had his own armor and in respect of that armor a hadith are settled that that armor after the holy prophet would only fit one who is entitled to be the true successor to the holy prophet and hence and this is what we discussed in 1996 when sayyid hasani will meet the 12th imam alayhi salam he will say i am sure you are the mahdi i can see the signs of the mahdi in you but my people are not sure and there would be a huge army by then that he would have accumulated coming out from khurasan he would have accumulated army in iran he would have accumulated army in in in, in afghanistan he would have accumulated army in multan and so quite a few people would have been with him he would wish to satisfy them and he would say show us show us the proofs that you are the mahdi and the imam alay salam say will say sayyid hasani i will put to you eight proofs here and now one of them will be the armor when imam sadiq alay salam said that he had he had the armor with him you might recall from our discussions of last year when imam baqir alay salam was told that people said that Hazrat Zaid is the true imam and Imam Baqir alayhi salam said how can he be he hasn't got the asliha the armaments of the holy prophet the person says well they say he has and Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said have you seen them with him he said no but so and so told me the imam alayhi salam said that is here say i have got them all with me and i have got the armor that fits me and i can show it to you We discussed this last year if you recall and that is exactly what Imam Sadiq alayhi salam is doing now he is telling he is telling his 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 companion and those who are listening to this Abdurrahman bin Hajjaj he is saying I have tried this armor and it fits only Musa he therefore is my true successor may I just interject only to take 5 seconds of your time and say that at that point in time Ismail was alive the imam therefore saying that it only fits musa is yet another proof that it did not fit ismail and indeed did not fit abdullah either well the next hadith in line is faith bin muhtar he says that as he was sitting with the sixty imam alayhi salam then there entered abu ibrahim abu ibrahim is the seventh imam imam kadhim alayhi salam and he was then a boy he was still a little boy and as the seventh imam alayhi salam entered the sixth imam alayhi salam told him faith bin muhtar and the companions who were sitting saying greet him greet him hada hada ashabukum fatamassaka bihi greet him he is your your master that is after him he is your master greet him and for the massacre be him and be associated with him be one and akin to him what another hadith is in respect of mansur bin hazim and he too says that when the imam alayhi salam introduced al kazim alayhi salam to me as his successor he was only 5 years old and if he was 5 years old only ismail was then again alive at that time a hadith comes from suleiman bin khalid and he says he went to to abu abdullah that is the sixth imam alayhi salam and asked him a question who 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 after you and the imam alayhi salam says him he was sitting there and that was al kadhim i rushed through this but i do want to take two more minutes no more with you on the 10th hadith that i am putting forward to you now and this this comes from yaqub bin saraj he says that he once went to the sixth imam alayhi salam to visit him on other business but he saw that the imam alayhi salam was playing and talking to a child in the cradle now no doubts remain that 
that Ismail was already born, no doubts, and was around and was much bigger than uh, the child in the cradle, and that Abdullah was also already born. But the Imam salam was talking to this child and playing with the child who was in the cradle. So, Yaqub says, I hesitated and I paused. I thought I should not disturb him in what he is doing. And he said, I stayed there until the Imam alayhi salam finished with the cradle and turned and saw me. When he saw me, I congratulated him. I said, Mola, Allah seems to have uh, showered his mercy on you to give you a child. And the Imam alayhi salam says, yes, great mercy of Allah, not only on me, but on the ummah also, that he, Siraj, will be the successor after me, he is Hujjatullah. O oh, Saraj, come and greet him. Normally, we don't greet children in cradle. The Jews, when maybe Maryam alayhi salam, pardon this distraction, but I won't keep you more than a minute on it. The Jews, when maybe Maryam alayhi salam came with the little child, turned around to her and said, Oh Maryam, you are a chaste lady. Your father and mother were chaste. What is this? How, how do you account for the fact that you have a child in your hand? This is Surah Maryam. And she says, she points to the child. For Asharat ilay. She pointed at the child. And the Jews say, Kaifa tukallimu man fil mahdi sabiyya. How do we talk to one who is a little child fil mahd in, in, in the cradle? Kaifa nukallim man kana fil mahdi sabiyya? How do we talk to a little child who is in a cradle? And the little child said, Ana Abdullah atani al kitab wa ja'alani nabiyya. And Nabi Isa spoke instantly. So those who are hujaj of Allah, Azza wa Jal, even in their childhood, are able not only to speak, but are able to speak so eloquently and to speak so poetically. Saying, Ana Abdullah, look at that beauty in it, that I am a servant of Allah. This is the first thing Nabi Isa said. Alas, that there are those who call him the son of God. But this is the first utterance of Nabi Isa, Ana Abdullah, Atani al Kitab. Allah has given me the book. This book doesn't come when I'm 40 years old. I bring it along with me. Waja'alani Nabiya because he has created me a prophet. So look at what happens with the seventh Imam alayhi salam against that background. The child in the cradle, Saraj is told, go and greet him. Saraj knows Quran, goes and greets the child, knows this is not an ordinary child. He is a Hujjatullah, goes and greets him, makes salam, kisses his hand. And says, says all the courtesies, the Arab courtesies to the little child. The little child instantly replies. Nabi Isa did speak. No question about it because Quran says so. And we know what he uttered. But we know that what Nabi Isa was saying was in answer to what the Jews were asking. The Jews asked his mother. How can we ask this little boy how he came to be born? He was doing no more than answering a question. The seventh Imam salam was not even asked a question. He offered advice. He offered guidance. Indeed, he offered hidayah. He offered hidayah to his companion unsolicited. A companion who he thought was not properly guided. When those courtesies was, were over this little child, opens his mouth and says in eloquent Arabic, he says, O oh, Saraj, Allah has favored you also with a child. <coughs> As though the child had heard Saraj congratulating the father. He says, Allah has also favored you with a daughter. <coughs> but the name you have given her yesterday is a name with which Allah is not pleased. O oh, Saraj, go home and change her name instantly. Saraj says, I was flabbergasted. This little child from the cradle speaking to me, 
in that manner? I turned to a Sadiq alayhi salam because who does he turn to? Turns to a Sadiq alayhi salam and a Sadiq says, Siraj, I told you, he is my successor, he is your master, Siraj, do what he has asked you to do, go home and change the name. Siraj says that I had truly had a daughter and the daughter was named only the day before and I had named her Humaira. Humaira, by the way, purely to clarify the issue, Humaira, by the way, is the name by which the Holy Prophet called Aisha. The Holy Prophet had his own pet name for Aisha. He used to call her by the name Humaira. And this is how not only did the Holy Prophet call her, but after him, the others also, the, the other widows of the Holy Prophet, may peace be upon him and his progeny, also called, called her Humaira. Siraj named his daughter Humaira. The seventh Imam salam, says, Allah is displeased with that name. Go home and change that name. What can I say? Need I say anything more? This is a child who gives guidance from that point in time. Could he not have said, Ana Abdullah, Ana Hujjatullah? Could he not have said that also? But all that is implicit in what he said. That Allah, that he knows the pleasure of Allah, and that he knows that Allah is displeased with a particular name, is in itself conclusive proof of what status this little child had. But let me tell you one more thing before I can even ask you whether I should not stop this majlis. And it is this, that we of course say that he was Hujjatullah. We say it from our books and I hope I will show you Sunni authorities which say that from eminent Sunnite sources who accept that he was the most learned because this is, this is the criterion, the most learned of all men living at the time. Only he can be the Imam. Can I just tell you that Sunnite sources, not Shiite, I repeat, Sunnite sources say that Ma'moon himself said, Ma'moon e Rashid, yes, leave Ma'moon, let us start with Harun. Harun e Rashid said that Imam Kazim is Hujjatullah. And if you want proof of that, then you will find it in that leading book, Uyunul Akhbari Radhaj. In volume 1, page 91, paragraph 11, he says that uh, Mahmud was asked how he comes to know about Shiaism and how he comes up to know about the seventh Imam alayhi salam. And he says, about him he says that he is, that he is qala qultu li abi. He said, my father told me this. The Imam alayhi salam, according to this particular hadith, happens to be there. And I will go into this in detail in the second reference I'm going to give you, so I will not take your time on it now. He says, my father told me, I asked him, قُلْتُ abi, I asked my father, Ya Amir al-Mu'minin, بَهَذَ rajul, Who is this man whom? الَّذِي أَعْظَمَهُ وَأَجَّلَلْتَهُ Who is this man whom you have given such high honor? Adhamtahu whom you have elevated in this way and whom you have you have given great dignity and you wakunta and you rose you were sitting on your throne you rose to receive him and and you welcomed him himself the other courtiers and the other people who came who were just received by other courtiers but you received him astaqbaltuhu and you yourself welcomed him and you 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 stood up and gave him a special place and made him sit next to you. Who is he? And then you ordered us, you ordered us to take him up to the the animal on which he came, and to mount him to help him mount on that uh, on that on that animal. Who is this man? Kala, hada imamun nas. This is Harun telling his son Mamun. May I put it crudely and say, this is the killer of the seventh Imam telling the killer of the eighth Imam alayhi salam that the seventh Imam is the Imamun Nas, 
He is the Imam of all humans alive. Imam al-Nas. You need no stronger words now. That is conclusive of my case. That he is the Hujja of Allah ala khalqi wa khalifatahu ala ibadi. What more do you want? He says he is not only the Hujja of Allah, but he is the Khalifa over his creatures. The next natural question to Harun is, what are you doing calling yourself Khalifa? Because Khalifatahu ala ibadi, you say, is this man. And this, mind you, doesn't come from our sources. Of course, our sources have this particular hadith more fully than the Sunnite sources. And I will, I will deal with that also. وَحُجَّةُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ خَلْقِ وَخَلِيفَتَهُ عَلَىٰ عِبَادِهِ فَقُلْتُ So when my father tells me this, Ma'moon says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, because he used to call his father that, أَوَلَيْسْتُ هَذَا الصِّفَاتُ كُلُّهَا لَكَ وَفِيكَ But aren't all these qualifications for you? And from you, aren't you the Khalifa? Aren't you the Amir al-Mu'mineen? Aren't you the Hujjat Allah? What is this? This is what we have been made to believe all these years. And you suddenly say that somebody else is. Let me read to you the answer of, of Harun. I am not keen to read Arabic because it takes my time. And I want to rush because we've got to finish in the next half an hour or so. But just this bit in Arabic so that you know that you are getting the authentic words, the words of Harun himself. He says, Faqala. أنا إمام الجامعة في الظاهر. I am, I am the Imam of the public populace, the general public. I think that may be correct. جامعة. I am the Imam of the general public. وموسى بن جعفر إمام الحق. And Musa بن جعفر is the real Imam. He is the true Imam. He is the حق. والله. And then he says, I swear by Allah, what more can you want? This man is swearing now. He's speaking this on oath to his son, Ya Bunaya. He says, Oh my beloved son, I swear by Allah. La ahakka bi maqami Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi minni wa man khalaqa jamia. I swear that by Allah, that the place of the holy prophet, may peace be upon him and his progeny, he, that, that he is more entitled to the place of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi over me and the entire creation of Allah. He therefore recognizes beyond question that the Imam alayhi salam is the hujjatullah and is entitled to that place, is more entitled to that place than him, than any other person, khalqullahu khalq jami'ah, than any other person, any other creature on earth. How can the case be stronger than that? I have not chosen a friend. I have chosen the worst enemy. And indeed, inshallah, on the eve of Ashura, we will discuss the enmity, the venom that Harun had in respect of Imam Kadhim alayhi salam. In other words, there was no worse person for Imam Kadhim alayhi salam. There was no worse enemy of him than Harun. And these are his words as reported in this particular, in this particular source. But the matter is more fully discussed in the quotations from Ma'amun himself, the, the, the son of Harun, the one who killed the eighth Imam alayhi salam, as we shall, inshallah, if uh, Allah so wills, discuss next year. The first, the first quotation really is from Uyun al-Akhbar al-Ridaj, again, first volume, page 93, which I will skip because of, the, of, of a problem on time. And indeed, that also, that very authority is in Mashariq al-Anwar al-Yaqeen at page 93. But the authority I do want to put to you, but I'll only resort to, to English at this time, is the one which appears in Mashariq al-Anwar al-Yaqeen, sorry, at page 94. That hadith, in extenso, but I'll put it very quickly, it comes from, from um, Al-Hafid Barsini, is this, that Harun decided to visit Medina because he was going to Hajj. But as he was the Khalif, he decided he would go to, to, to Medina first. 
So he came to Medina on his way to Mecca. And when the Khalif arrives in Medina, the rule was that the, the established people of that city, the, elder, the elders of the city, go a few yards outside the city to welcome him. And they bring him to the court. And that is what happened. And then they each enter the court and they are introduced to the Khalif, as perhaps happens even today in, a, in, a, in protocol when a head of state visits another state. Well, Mamun says, when that happened, we of course were the princes, so we were in the forefront. And then the elders of the state came in one after the other. Then came an elderly person who looked quite feeble and looked sick too. He was riding on his animal. He doesn't say what the animal was. He says riding on his animal. And when Harun, although he was seeing and, and was being introduced to the, to the guests in the queue one after the other, when he spotted him, he instantly issued instructions to Rabir saying, Rabir, go and tell him. Go and tell the gentleman who is still on his animal not to dismount, not to take the trouble to dismount and he should come to me on riding his animal. Normally it is rude. It is rude to go to the head of state, to go to, to visit the Khalif and, and, and get into his palace and indeed up to his throne riding an animal. But he sends this message. So the Imam alayhi salam remains on, on, on his animal and it is when he comes very close that he is helped to dismount. Ma'moon says, my father goes ahead. He doesn't wait for the guest to come to him. The guest is now dismounting. So he goes himself, meets him, greets him, hugs him, kisses him between the eyes, asks him how he is, asks him how his father is. Look, asks him how he is. Kaifa anta ya abal Hassan? Kaifa ayalik? How is your family? And then asks, how is the family of your father? All, all those questions. كَيْفَ حَالِكُمْ وَهُوَ يَقُولْ خَيْرٌ خَيْرٌ All that the Imam alayhi salam answered was khair. No more. No, no second, second word to him. Well, then he keeps him next to him and converses with him. When everything was over, when he was about to leave, because he was, was, he was one of the first to seek leave, to go away, and, and Harun instantly granted leave. Harun tells both Ma'moon and Amin, his two sons, reach him to his house, help him mount and reach him to his house. So Ma'moon said the result was that this old man was on his horse, on his, on his animal, riding away and my brother and I were on our feet, walking with him alongside. Mamun said, I didn't much mind that. My father had told me to do it. I was quite happy to give this respect to this old man. But I was curious. Why am I, the prince, being made to do this? Who is this man? And so, when everything is, was over, I saw my father in total secrecy. And we will see this sort of thing next year also. And, the, and, and particularly when we discuss the, 11th, the life of the 11th Imam, salam, it becomes manifest. However, he says, when I saw my father in secrecy and I asked him, who is this man? Man hadha rajul, again the same, same question, says, Ya Bunaya, hadha warithi ulum al awwaleen wal akhireen. If knowledge is the criterion of imama, then Harun Rashid says, this is the person who is the inheritor of all knowledge from the first to the last knowledge of all Anbiya, all Rusul, from the Varitha Ulum al Awwalina wal Akhirin, any knowledge that the first of humans and the last of them ever had, he is the inheritor, all that knowledge is, is accumulated in him. All that knowledge is gathered in the Imamul Mubin, which indeed is how Harun describes him to his son Ma'amun. And then he says, Hada Musa ibn Ja'far. Gives the exact name to his son because he asks, Who is this man? Fa in aratta ilman haqqan. Fa in the hada. If you want, if you intend to get true knowledge, 
then that is vested in him. All doubts resolved, I could wind up this majlis now and say what more proof do we want to give to any of the other sects of Islam here. Yeah. And there is no question that Harud was one of the well, well informed and well versed men of, of the world of that time. And this is how he puts the matter in respect of the Imam. And this is reported by his own son. And indeed, this is no diplomacy now. It is not said in the court. It is said in secrecy to his son, who, who is told the truth. That if in truth you want information on any matter, then this is the person and he is the Hujjatullahu Haqqa. And indeed, this sort of vein is discussed in a number of other Sunni sources to rush through them. The Hadib al Tahdib in volume 10 at page 430 sets out those qualities of Imam Kadim, and again you will find them, you'll find the matter in Sifat al Sufur in volume 2 at page 184 and in, the, in the paragraph 191. And indeed in Mizan al Artidal in uh, volume 4, page 202. Paragraph 8855, all those volumes. But I'm rushing because one thing I wanted to say, and I did not want to miss saying tonight because nights are passing and we have to attempt at the cost sometime of leaving material untouched. We've got to cover the important issues at least. And one of the most important issues about the seventh Imam alayhi salam is that he is Babul Hawaij. In other words, the gateway to the fulfillment of our wishes. Just as it is said of Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam, that he is Babul Hawaij, you have a haja, you want it fulfilled, seek from Allah in the name of Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam. Likewise, it is said, seek your haja in the name of Imam Kadim alayhi salam, and any nazar kept in his name, is almost guaranteed to be fulfilled. Any wish sought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the name of al kathim alayhi salam is almost guaranteed to be fulfilled. He is the gate through which if those haja pass, they reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Babu al hawaj Well, of course I say this. And I say this not only because I've read this in our books of our scholars, I say this because my elders have told me, my father has told me, my, my uncle has told me, my elderly friends all round have told me. They have told me all over the world. It is not only in Bombay that I am told or in London or in Dar es Salaam, all over the world. Everybody has said. And I have learned it best in Kazabain when you enter the Zari of, of Imam Kazim alayhi salam. Almost Everybody around there calls him by that name, says, Ya Babul Hawaij, and puts forward his, his, his wishes to, to the Imam alayhi salam in the knowledge that Allah has given him the authority to have these, these Hawaij fulfilled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, I just said how I say these things and why I say so. But it does not end with us shares saying so. That is a statement you find in leading Sunnite sources. When Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah members have been in trouble not having their wishes fulfilled, they have gone to Kazamain. If they haven't, they have from wherever they are sought help from Allah in the name and for the sake of the seventh Imam alayhi salam. And if you wish to query me on this, proof of it in numerous, numerous. Time of course doesn't permit us to go through them all. Can I just give you half a dozen names, if you like, which you can refer to yourselves. For example, what better name can I give you? What better book can I quote than Sawa'iq Muharika? Sawa'iq Muharika, and I must have said this half a dozen times before in the years that I've been coming to Bombay by the grace of Allah. Sawa'iq Muharika is written by Ibn Hajar and Makki against the Shias. It is meant to burn the hearts of Shias. And in that book, in Sawa'ik uh, and, and and you will find this in, um, in, um, in, in that book at page 121. 
he, he sets out the, the, the qualities of Imam Kadhim alayhi salam. He says, Musa al Kadhim wa huwa warithu ilma. And he calls him, calls him by that epithet Kadhim. Indeed. Indeed. He had three epithets, but Kadhim became the most famous. The first is Sabir. And a number, in a number of ahadiths, those who are reporting things tend to call him Sayyidu Sabir. The, the one who is Sabir, and we will talk about that more perhaps on, on, on the eve of Ashura. But that is, is one epithet. Another is Saleh, Abdul Saleh, and I will come back to that. And the third is Kadhim. Kadhim, Sheikh Abbas Kumi says he's known as Kadhim for two reasons. The one that is generally given, particularly in Sunnite books, that he was one who was able to restrain his anger. And that title became famous because the people who were asked to keep the Imam al Islam in custody in their prisons, all of them unanimously reported to Harun that this person has not even once said even one word against you or against us who kept him. If we gave him little food, it was Alhamdulillah. If we gave him very hot water, it was Alhamdulillah. Not once. Has even one word been said against you who imprisoned him or against us or against any enemy of Imam Ali alayhi salam or of the Shias? And this arose because Harun was trying to find an excuse to punish the Imam alayhi salam. That you uttered such and such a word, that you made such and such an accusation. He says not one word ever uttered by him. And indeed, the second reason that Sheikh Abbas Kumi gives is... That it was in his nature, and we will see this again also, either on Wednesday night or if not Thursday night, but inshallah we will not miss to discuss that aspect of the matter. It was in his nature that if anybody did harm to him, he would repay it with, with, with a favor. He always repaid injury with a favor. You cause him loss, he will cause you profit. You call him by ill name, he will call you by good name. That was indeed how he always lived and hence earned that particular epithet. You see, you see here that uh, Ahmad bin Hajar calls him by that name, Musa al kadhim just as we do. So that is an epithet well known amongst all Muslims. And he says, he says he is warith, the inheritor of all knowledge. He says, وَهُوَ وَارِثُ عِلْمًا وَمَعْرِفًا وَكَمَالًا وَفَضْلًا Of all perfections and all excellences. We have finished discussing the imama and the proof of imama. But if we still need it, here it is. All these in a row showing that this person has all the qualifications of a true imam. And then goes further and says, that he is called 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 Kadim because of his great restraint, wahilmuhu and his patience, and kana ma'rufan in the ahl al Iraq and the people of Iraq popularly known him as bibabul qada il hawaij in the Allah. That he is the gateway for fulfillment of wishes to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Wa kana abudu ahl zamanuhu wa alamuhum wa ashahum. And he says, in his time, he was the best of the creatures of, of Allah. And the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable of them, and the most selected of them. Is any more proof required of the fact that he was an imam? And Ibn Khalaqan also mentions of him, and, and mentions of him being Babul Hawaij, and the reference to him is in Wifaya, um, in uh, volume 4, page 393. Again, sh the Shafi writer, Muhammad bin Talha, that is a Shafi writer, who oh, he sets out a range of qualifications of uh, Imam Kadim alayhi salam. There is hardly a praise that he has omitted in a paragraph, one after the other, the best of men, the most pious of men, and indeed he calls him, and I just say this in passing so that I don't, when I come to it, I don't have to repeat it. He calls him indeed, Zinatul Mutahajideen. We know Zainul Abideen, we now have Zinatul Mutahajideen. That means the ornament of those who recite Namaz Shah. I've put it very, very simply. Those 
zina, the ornament, the decoration of those who recite the salah of tahajjud. Because he would wake up in the small hours of the night, not until the time of tahajjud. And from then onwards his tahajjud would start. And he would go on in tahajjud up to fajr. And then from fajr, having said his, his, his two rakah, he would remain in his taqibat up to sunrise. Indeed, even after sunrise, he would be in the sajda right up to dhuhr. Right up to dhuhr. <coughs> and we get this from those who had imprisoned him, not his friends. That, that is him. Well, from that hour, small hours up to fajr, tahajjud, some of us recite the Mazishab in half an hour, some of us in 20 minutes, some of us in 15 minutes. I've known those say, well, I finished the Mazishab in 15 minutes. So there we are. What is this person doing for four, five hours reciting the Mazishab? Question, what is the far he makes in the Mazishab? He lowers his head and says, I'm ashamed to say this. May Allah forgive me for this because I only do istighfar 5,000 times. 5,000 times. We finish at 70 and 300 of Al-Af. He says, the istighfar of course, what is known as istighfar there is 70. He says, may Allah forgive him. He does it only 5,000 times every door or every pre-door. And that is, that is a title by which uh, Muhammad bin Talha Shafi'i remembers him and goes further to say that he is Babul Hawaij, Ma'roof fil Iraq, bi Babul Hawaij Allah. So that proof comes from there. And if a Shafi is not enough, then Maliki, Ibn Sabbagh Maliki, he says exactly that in his Fusul al Muhimma, page 231. And indeed, indeed, Sheikh Muhammad al Sabbagh says the matter, says, sets out that matter in As'afu al-Raghibin at page 226, calls him Babu al-Hawaij, bi Babu Khadai al-Hawaij in the Allah, wa kana min abdi ahli zamanihi, wa man akabir al-ulama. Of the ulama, he was the most, the greatest of them. He, of the ulama, he was the greatest of them. So you can see all these proofs of his, of his imama emerging there. But the point I wanted to make was that he is regarded as Babul Hawaij by those who are not even his friends. And it is accepted that in Iraq, this is a matter of common knowledge that he is Babul Hawaij. I wish to say this much tonight on the seventh eve of Muharram, that would it not be a great pity for that Shia in trouble, who does not resort to Imam Qadim alayhi salam. Who does not resort to Imam Qadim alayhi salam. Because that is the gateway. We need not be in trouble in this world. We need not be in afflictions and in sicknesses and in poverty. Let us resort, let us learn to resort. When I was asked to speak about these Imams alayhi salam, I was told, we don't know about these Imams. We've only heard of Imam Ali and Imam Hussein and perhaps Hazrat Abbas. Let us know that Imam Kazim alayhi salam is of that weight and wishes sought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the name of Imam Kazim go through. And let us make that, <coughs> let us make that uh, a, a matter of our nature. And indeed, why not? He has suffered so much in the name of, 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 of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he has served him in so many ways. Indeed, people have reported numerous traditions about, on his authority because he was that much knowledgeable in law. Even today, when you look at the tafasir of Quran, so many verses are, are, are commented upon by him and explained by him. So many ahadiths, Duas in particular, so many duas taught by Imam Kazim alayhi salam, some of which <coughs> we will make reference to, or at least we will we will we will mention off in 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 in, 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 in the nights when we discuss the problems he had and how he and how he dealt with them. And indeed, talking of the tafsir of Quran, he was known to be one of the greatest erudites 
on interpretation and commentary on Quran on Quran and it is said that when he recited Quran he recited in such a voice <coughs> and in such a manner that if anybody passed by for example if he was reciting in Masjid al-Nabawi anybody coming there would immediately sit down and want to listen to him and it is said that as people listen to him, they would be weeping and crying because that is how he read Quran, because that is how the Prophet read Quran. And indeed, one would almost think that a majlis is going on when Quran was being recited by him. That was the that was the marifa with which he recited Quran. And indeed, he is known as Zaydul Butahajideen, Khatib Baghdadi. Now he is one of the most eminent Sunnite historians. I don't quote him as much as Tabari because Tabari is translated into English. Your access to him is easier than Khatib Baghdadi. But Khatib Baghdadi says that that epithet that he was given of Zainul Mutahajideen is so apt. He says on one occasion, he goes to Masjid al Nabawi. It was not an occasion when the Imam salam was making a speech or so, but he was in sajda and he said, this is after breakfast. Why is this Alim Zahid in Sajda? What is he doing? And he remained in Sajda. Indeed, he said he remained in Sajda until the until the Avan of uh, of uh, Zahar. He said, "I wanted to listen to what he says, and I say this only so that we can pick up on these things." <coughs> and he said, "I heard him recite two prayers particularly repeatedly amongst other prayers." One of them was, Allahumma inni as'aluka rahatan inda al-mawt wal-afu inda al-hisab. Those two prayers. He said, I heard him repeat them often and not often. This is a scholar in his own right, this Baghdadi. And he wants to learn from Imam, from Imam Kazim alayhi salam. What is he reciting in sajda? He says, Allahumma inni as'aluka rahatan inda al-mawt wal-afu inda al-hisab. And the second one, he says, O oh Allah, a sin from your creatures is great for you. Indeed, a sin, we, we unfortunately, and may Allah give us the tawfiq to regard sin as something serious. He says to Allah, to you, you creature committing sin, is a great matter, is a great affair, it's a serious matter. Let your forgiveness of those sins become even more pleasant for you than the greatness, become even greater for you than the greatness of the sin. And he says, I kept hearing you repeat that and I made a note of that so that I, so that I too recite that. Isn't it time we started following what our A'imma alayhimu salam recite in their sajda? We have had occasion last year to, to see and to learn what Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salam was reciting. And of his du'as, this also was one of them. Azuma dhanbu min abdik, fal yahsinul af min indik, ya kareem. And his fadail are matters that are famous. But we cannot enter upon, upon that time does not permit us at this stage. Tomorrow, insha'Allah, we shall see that. But one thing about him was that he never saw a person in difficulty without rushing to give him help. Indeed, if he saw a thirsty man, he would leave all his commitments, rush to give him water. Seventh Eve of Muharram, we remember that order of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad alayhi, in which he wrote a letter to Umar ibn Sa'ad says, O oh Umar, make sure you have already asked that the tents of Imam Hussein alayhi salam be moved from the bank to further away. But now make sure that, the, that Hussein alayhi salam does not get even one drop of water from the water of Fura. <coughs> And immediately orders are issued Amr, to, to Hajjaj bin Amr with 500 people, 500 people rounding up the bank of Furat so that nobody from the camp of Imam Hussein is able to enter Furat 
and get water from it. Imam Hussain alayhi salam was thirsty for three days. He was hungry of three days also. We have never heard, never heard of Imam Hussain alayhi salam telling his enemies there, I am hungry, give me some food. You have never heard that. That would be beneath him. But we have always heard of him saying that I am thirsty. <laughs> My children are thirsty, give me water. Because water is a matter of human rights. Food is prepared by men and served on men. Water is prepared by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the water from Furat was meant for everybody. Not only for men, but for beasts and animals also. <laughs> How could it be stopped on Hussain alayhi salam? Indeed, the reason given was, we will stop water. As water was stopped on Uthman bin Affan, we turn to Ubaidullah and say, oh, Ubaidullah. Water was stopped on Uthman, but when water was stopped on Uthman, he sought help from Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi <laughs> All of them sought help from Hazrat Ali alayhi salam. It is only we who are told today that seeking help from Imam Ali is bid'ah. The Khulafa did it themselves. Uthman when in trouble asked for water from Imam Ali. And if Imam Ali alayhi salam sent water to him, he sent Hassanayn alayhi salam. Oh, by the law, it is Hussein who sent water to Uthman bin Affan. You are closing down water on him today. But from seventh, not a drop was allowed officially to go to Hussein alayhi salam. So much so, so much so, that on that eve of Ashura, Hur says, I trembled when I heard little children in the camp of Hussein saying, Al-Ataj, Al-Ataj, oh thirst is killing us, thirst is killing us. That also was the situation of Hazrat Qasim alayhi salam. Indeed, of him it is said that on the leave of Ashura, he asked Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Oh my uncle, tomorrow is a day of sacrifice. Will I also be included amongst the shuhada? <laughs> How was Hussein to tell his nephew that yes, Qasim, you also will die tomorrow? <laughs> Hussein did not have the heart to tell Qasim this. Says to Qasim, Qasim, it will be a day of shuhada and lots of my people will die. Qasim asks again, oh, oh uncle, will I also die? Because I am dying to die on your cause. How is Hussein to reply? He turns around and says, Qasim, tell you this much that even your little brother Azhar will also be murdered tomorrow. Qasim was sitting, stood up and said, Uncle, you mean the enemies will enter the camp and slaughter my, my brother Azhar there? Hussein says, no, Qasim, they will not go that far. I will take Azhar for water. Water was the theme. And they will, they will transfix him with an arrow. But the day comes. The next day comes. Qasim goes to Imam Hussein. Hussein says, Qasim, I will not let you go. You are the remembrance of my brother Hassan. I will not let you go to die. Hussein was unable to part with Qasim. This is why I always say, the shahada of Imam Hussein was not the great musibah for him. Those arrows did not matter. Those swords did not matter. His separation from those he loved so much, who were so dear to him, to allow them to go and sacrifice their lives is indeed what killed Hussein many times before Shimr Allah managed to do so. Ultimately, Umm Farwa comes to Hussein and says, Hussein, you have been saying no to Qasim. I can't bear this. Hussein, you know it was the wasiya of Hassan that, that Qasim should represent him in Karbala today. I have come to ask you for leave so that when I meet Hassan, I am not ashamed to him so that I can tell him, indeed, I fulfilled your wasiya. Hussein says, Umm Farwa, now you are rendering me helpless. But he took out the gown, the Abba of Hassan, adorned Qasim with that Abba, put the turban of Hassan on the head of Qasim, looks at Qasim and says, Qasim, I now see my brother Hassan. Let Hassan go and sacrifice himself on this day for the cause of, for the cause of Islam. 
and indeed when ultimately Qasim falls and calls for him Ya Amma Ya Amma Adrikni Oh my, oh my uncle come to my help the Imam alayhi salam becomes so furious that they killed his nephew that the fury in which he left all those enemies now scared that they would be killed by Hussein panicked in their panic they rushed on the body of Qasim those hooves of their horses cut the body of Qasim into pieces indeed Muslim says وَقَطَعُوهُ عِرْبَ عِرْبَ they cut the body of Qasim into little pieces all over indeed when Hussein came to take the body into the camp he could not even lift the body of Qasim he removed his Aba spread the Aba on the ground picked up pieces of Qasim and then with one side with carrying by him another by Abbas takes those pieces to the camp calls Umme Farwa and says Umme Farwa you wanted you wanted Qasim to be sacrificed see how Qasim has got himself sacrificed he not only got himself killed but he got himself cut into such small pieces Allah al-anatullahi ala al-qawmi al-zalimin wa say'alamu al-lazina zalamu wa ayya munqalabin yanqalibun inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un rahimallahu man yakra al-fatiha